What's going on, everybody? How are you doing today? Good? Thumbs up if you're good. Thumbs in the middle if you're so-so. Thumbs down if you're down in the dumps. Let's be honest, it's true. Sometimes I'm down in the dumps. But I wanted to encourage you guys and thank you so much for coming out today. Let's take a moment to greet one another. So if you're going to greet uh, a lady or a woman, say hello, sister. And if you're going to greet a guy, say hello, brother. All right, take a moment and do that.
you, Pastor Matt. That was awesome this morning. You know what? One of my dreams, I have a couple of dreams when I get to heaven. One of them is, I'm going to take over for Cliff Barrows. <laughs> and lead the singing. And I wanted to jump up here this morning and just lead you all. Because you sound so great this morning. Thank you. Thank you for singing. Please be seated. We're grateful for your presence here. If there are seats in your row, um, do we still need some seats, Father? Amen. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. A couple of announcements this morning that I want to share with you. We will receive an offering at the end of the service again as we uh, conclude this morning. And we uh, are grateful for your faithfulness in sharing with us in uh, those offerings. Secondly, a reminder once again to stay up with what's happening by uh, being on the email list. It's coastal.wnl, coastal.wholenotherlevel. And that way you can stay up on what's taking place over the weeks. We are flexible, as you know, and we're grateful for that. We are um, expecting probably to be here next Sunday, but you have to stay up on what's happening on the list. And so we just want to thank you for that. Also, I want to share with you a date that's coming up on July the 24th. Yes. Lord willing, we have a service of baptism at Swan Lake. And so you'll need to watch for details on that. That's the 24th of July. So it's a month out, but uh, hopefully you'll be um, on tap for that evening. All right? So we um, just want to invite you to share in that occasion. Yeah, Pastor Matt's going to come. So, I just wanted to share with you, some of you probably already know, but maybe you haven't, um, about something that happened this past week that's just worth mentioning. Um, my son Jesse's here, and he actually insisted that we not mention this story, but my <laughs> wife and I decided to pull a parental override and say that we're just going to have to tell you that this past week, um, like a scene out of a movie, he was simply walking down the beach with his girlfriend. And uh, in the midst of walking down the beach somewhere around 6.30 at night, there was screaming that was coming from out in the water. And here there were two boys that were drowning in the ocean um, right off of the jetty. So if you see signs that say, don't walk on the jetty, there's a reason for that. Well, they fell in, and the one was able to grab hold of the rocks, and the other was literally drowning. And Jesse just simply ran out there, and then it got to the point where you just can't run anymore, and you fall. And then he just started swimming out there and made his way to this young man about 16 years old. And he grabbed him, and like uh, the classic scene that most of us have seen, the young man pushed Jesse down. And he had to back up, recalibrate, and then come back in from the side. And I was asking Jesse, do, do, what were you thinking? Was this some miracle? Do you feel like this was like, and he said, I think the greatest miracle was being able to hear the people on the beach screaming, swim to the side, swim to the side, because they were caught in a rip current and he couldn't come in. But he said when he swam about seven yards to the side, all of a sudden he was able to come in. And so with that feeling you get in your heart, he has this young man by the side, and he said, after a few minutes, he started to feel that feeling where you get the sand under your toes, and you go, I'm going to make it. Amen. And then they made it into the water, and then it ends kind of comically, because Jesse said when he got about within 20 feet of the sand, a lifeguard threw him one of those things. <laughs> 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 I said, well, what'd you do then? He goes, well, you know, I grabbed it all, but I thought, can I just bring the guy in? And then I did it all. I thought he brought him in. So the family was there, and they were so thankful. And then somehow the police came and everything. And one lifeguard who was off duty was there. That's how he ran up late. And <laughs> threw the rope to Jesse. And uh, um, so they got his number, and Jesse was able to talk with the family. And the mother actually wants to come and testify. They were from Philadelphia, and they were visiting for the day, and it was two brothers, and it just it ended miraculously instead of tragically. 
and it's just amazing to watch uh, God using you know those that are in our our church family, and we'd be amiss if we just didn't celebrate how God's using us in any particular way. Yeah.
And so we celebrate with you this morning, and we're grateful for that. Let's just pray together as we commit the study of the Word this morning. Father, once again, we bow in your presence. We have sung how great you are, and it resonates with our souls. We are amazed at your grace and your mercy and your creativity and at your presence in our lives. The scripture says that you walk with us every day, that you know everything that we say, you hear every word, you are part of our lives. And I don't know how that's possible because there are millions of us around the face of the earth, but you are intimately involved. And so this morning, Father, we ask that you would enable us to be attentive to your word, to be intimately involved in what you have to say through your servant. We commit these moments to you and ask for your gracious care and minister to us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, so we are going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you want to turn there in your Bible, we always want to be bringing our Bibles so that we can always be writing in the margin or taking notes and keeping those things with us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we're going to be. And as you're turning there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'll just give you a quick backstory as to how we got here through chapter 1. Paul comes to the city of Thessalonica, and as he writes this first chapter, he starts talking to them about the way that they were living. Paul, Silas, Timothy, it was actually confirming what they were saying. And we spent some time talking about that last week, how important it is that the way that you live confirms what you say. Remember when we were talking about put your money where your mouth is, right? And walk in the talk and how important that is. And whether you're a believer or not a believer, people that don't have respect for people that don't walk the talk, right? That don't put their money where their mouth is. So, like, that's just an important principle just in life in general. And then how do you, we talked about how do you continue steadfast even in the midst of adversity? And that's what Paul did, right, with his team. They continued steadfast. They continued to be faithful even in the midst of adversity. I know for some of us, um, it doesn't take too much before we just decide to, you know, hit the snooze, you know, in the morning. Like, talk about adversity. I'm tired. Snooze. Right? Uh, I don't need a shower. Snooze. Right? Uh, I've only been late twice this week. Snooze. I don't mind being on welfare. Snooze. Right? And the next thing you know, like, we, 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 we face these trials along the way. We really don't engage them, embrace them, and overcome them, and we turn around and we feel like we really didn't make the progress we could have made. Um, I was talking with Jane Abbott this past week. I don't know if Jane's yes. here. Is she here? I didn't see no. her. Okay. Hopefully she's not watching this. So, <laughs> Laura and I were in the car and we called Jane just to say it was great to see you last week, and we were talking about you know, the weather breaking and exercise, and Jane said, well, you know, I really feel like I need to go out walking, but... I don't like to walk when it's just so cold. And I don't like to walk either when it's hot. <laughs> or rainy. <laughs> or when it's going to rain. Or after it just rained. I don't like to walk. <laughs> and, I just, uh, and then we all just started laughing on the phone because like, we let every little thing get in the way of the direction we want to go because adversity has a way of creeping in there. But if we're going to lead people to the Lord, we need to be examples of the Lord. And there's few greater examples of Jesus Christ than continuing to be steadfast and immovable and always abounding towards the work of his Father, regardless of the circumstances that were happening all around him. The people that were chiding him, criticizing him, coming down on him. What did he say? Remember, Jesus said, I played a funeral song for you and you would not cry. And then I played a happy song for you when you would not dance. Like Jesus did everything he could to try to embrace the people, but they just were not following him. They were adversarial to him, but he kept on doing the will of his father. So much to the point that you come to John 17 and he's praying to his father on his way to the garden. He says, Father, I've accomplished all that you've given me to do. It's a really powerful sentence. Isn't that what you want to say in your life today? You want to say, 
Somewhere when you run your course, there comes a day when you say, Father, I've accomplished the course that you've given me to do. And I just look at that and I see Paul on that road to that point where he finally says, I've run that race. I fought that fight. I finished that course. And now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Like that's the day we're all waiting for, right? Mm -hmm. So, so let's look at this. First Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to be starting in verse 1 and we'll see what's here for us. He says this to them. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were, these are words you want to underline, suffered, and then here you have shamefully entreated, as you know in Philippi, look what he says here, we were bold, I underlined this, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. We like this. So for me, that's a phrase. Like I'll just take a pen and I'll just. We were bold in our God. Like what? Like I am bold in a lot of things, but am I bold in my God? I'll be bold in my car if you cut me off when I'm on the causeway, right? I'm going to speed up and get into whatever logistical position I need to get into to let you know, yo, you messed up. I'll be pretty bold to get into that particular position. And how bold are we? And so you heard me, or I know at this point I have my rights. All these types of things that we say we're bold about. You know, if you ever heard me on the phone with Comcast, I am a pretty bold individual. <laughs> right. yeah. My family leaves the room pulling their hair like, oh my gosh, Dad. <laughs> That's not what I said. Where are you from? Right? Like, I'm just going out there. So, like, I'm bold in that moment, like, because I'm from Philly, right? Like, if you park your car in the wrong place, it's like, yo, you just don't even talk, you just go, what's up? And it's just like an unspoken language, and this is like, this could be a fight because your car's too close to mine. So I'm just saying, like, here he's talking about being bold, but his boldness is in the context of sharing the gospel, and then the last phrase just totally kills it. Even in much contention. And I just think how many times I missed opportunities to share when they're just so simple to share. I think I missed one last week where I was in a hurry, and that's the excuse I gave myself. Because I was going through a line, I was just buying one item, and I forget what happened, and, uh, and uh, the person at the cash register down the road, so I'm getting off in 10 minutes, and some other person goes, man, it feels like forever. And my guy goes, yeah, well, nothing lasts forever. Uh, and I'm like a Christian and I happen to know that God's love lasts forever and hell is forever and I took my bottle of like beard oil or whatever I was getting and just went to the car and I'm just like you missed it dude I had an opportunity to share there but guess what I wasn't I wasn't bold in my God I was bold in my beard oil I'm just saying, like, I look at that, I go, I'm not going to condemn myself. I know that Jesus is gracious to me, but I have to also have the humility to say, I missed that one. I don't want to miss that one. I want to be, I want to be bold in God above, above, above all things. Verse 3, our exhortation, watch this now, get a pen. You want to circle the word contention in verse 2, but now here's exhortation in verse 3. Notice the contrast. There's much contention, but our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor of guile. These are very, three very similar words in the original language. It's just he's trying to establish his integrity. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but pleasing God, which trieth our hearts. Fascinating, we could spend all day just right here in this particular verse. But as we were allowed, that word allowed is actually the word dokimazo. It means to, to test or to try something. Like if you were to pick something up and you were to make sure that it was in proper working order and then set it down and then make sure that it operates. You're like, okay, I tried that, I tested it, that, I, that mechanics of that actually works. He's saying, God, like, he, 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 that's what he did with us. He tested us, he tried us, we passed the test, he found us worthy, and guess what he did next? Can you give me your attention? 
This is what he did next. He said, okay, I'm now going to entrust you with something. Here it is. Duty. It's called the gospel. You don't have to take it. That's <laughs> He's like, um, I, I believe and I know and I'm, I love you. I've adopted you into my family. You're my child. I'm going to entrust you with something called the gospel. And he says, I'm giving you the gospel, the gospel of God. And, and, and he says, and because of that, now we speak. Why? Not because we want to please men, but we want to speak, but to speak and we want to please God. Who, listen, who tries the hearts? Do you see that? By the word, by the way, the word try there, that God tries our hearts, you know what that word is in the Greek? Dokimato. It's the same word. He's the one who tests our hearts and tries our hearts and says, and you're ready. You're the one I want to entrust with the truth. In verse 4, the Apostle Paul says that they were entrusted with the gospel. Let's just talk for a minute. I know it's warm. Stick with me. Entrusted is such a unique word. There was a stewardship given unto us, is what Paul was saying. From the one God who tries and tests and scrutinizes the hearts of men. And he's seen us and says, in me, you're worthy to receive this. Adoption into my family. The message of my adoption papers for which I want you to take and share and spread to the rest of the world. A steward, a steward is not a word we use too often anymore. A steward is someone who was entrusted with the management of another's palace or another's valuable possessions or another's oversight of another person or persons. Now, the steward, understand this, the steward does not own the master's palace or his possessions, but he's entrusted to be responsible with the treasure that belongs to the master. Do you see the metaphor that's happening here? You're the steward. Jesus speaks in the opening verses of Luke chapter 17, and he talks about a day that shall come where every man shall give account for what he was entrusted with. Then there's more. There's more than one parable about people that received a stewardship in the Gospels. And guess what? They were not faithful. Some people were rewarded for being resourceful with their stewardship that was entrusted unto them, and they gave that even greater treasure to their master. On the other hand, there were people that were not. There were people that took their stewardship and they spent it on themselves. There were some people that actually took their stewardship and they took it and they hid it in the ground. There are some people that took their stewardship of the land and trusted to them, and then when the master sent his servants and messengers to receive the profits from the land, they actually keep his servants from the land. Yeah, kept them from the land. And then actually killed them and said, let's keep it for ourselves. So you can imagine. So for me, here's the convicting question. And if you've got a pen, I'm saying, please write this down. Put this in your margin. Write this in that little top space above your Bible page right there where you got a half an inch. Just write this. What would really happen if we believed to the core of our being that the message of the gospel is a treasure entrusted to us by God? Let me say it again. What would happen if you really believed that the message of the gospel was a treasure, a treasure entrusted to you by God. That brought something with me. I'm not really an illustrator, but I thought about this last night. But what if I told you right now that what I have in my hand right here is the cure? Carcinoma. How valuable would this be to you? 
And I told you that there were a lot of people that gave their lives for this. I spent everything that I had in order to have this. In fact, this is the most valuable thing on the earth right now. And what I really want to do with this right now, Judy, Julie, so I want, I want to entrust this to you. I want to entrust this to you. A cure for carcinoma. A cure for cancer. Now, how, how much do you think she would protect that? We're talking about the world. We're talking about people that we've loved and that have gotten sick, people that have died. My illustration is going to break down because I don't think I brought the other <laughs> cure. <laughs> I come up with this stuff at like 4 a.m. On the halls, I'm in the loop, just. <laughs> Let's just pretend that <laughs> And then, after you got that, you're holding on to it. Then I come over to Dr. Emmons and I say um, that, that Julie has the cure for carcinoma, but I have the cure here for something else called hamartia. Now, I'm picking on Dr. Emmons because he knows what hamartia is. It's, it's a word in the Greek that means what? Can you say it nice and loud? Sin. This won't actually cure cancer. This will cure the sin of every sinner in every generation. And actually, I had to take it and I actually was infected by it to make sure that it worked before I gave it to you. I gave everything I had to make sure that you could have it and I entrust it now to you. What would you do if you believed in the core of your being, that God entrusted you with the cure for harm or sin, with the cure for sin. Because he did. Because you do. It's been entrusted to you. And we jump from TJ Maxx to Value City and to ShopRite and every other place, and me jumping in and getting my beard oil and not even thinking Christ without telling this guy that if he doesn't know Christ, he's lost. And I know there's a balance in it all, you know, and I'm not saying that you gotta be weird, like when you're when your plumber goes under the sink and you're crawling under there with him. <laughs> 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 you know there's something happening right now? If you go to heaven, you have a tic tac? <laughs> I'm looking and I'm praying for that moment where I'm going to engage this person with the truth of the gospel and I'm just saying, hey man, I love Jesus and I miss it. And maybe I'm the only one, it should probably be me, I guess. <laughs> but maybe someone that does here too and I'm saying, what would happen if we really believed in the core of our being that we had the cure? We had the cure for, for a disease that went on into eternity. Think about it. We've got to keep moving. Verse 5 says this, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as apostles of Christ. Let me read to you the exact same thing I just read, and I'm going to read it to you in the message version, which is actually not a version, it's a paraphrase. But it gives it to you in a very modern English expression and it says this. God tested us. And of course the, um, the, the author of this uses the word test us because he saw the word dokimanza. God tested us thoroughly to make sure we were qualified to be trusted with this message. To be assured that when we speak to you, we're not after crowd approval, only God approval. Since we've been put through the battery of tests, you're guaranteed that both we and the message are free of error, mixed motives, or hidden agendas. They're all very similar words. We never use words to butter you up. No one knows that better than you. As God knows, we never use words as a smokescreen to take advantage of you. Even though we had some standing as apostles, 
Christ's apostles, we never throw our weight around or try to come across as important with you or anyone else. We weren't standoffish with you. We took you just as you were. We were never patronizing. We were never condescending. That's it. So what I'm saying is, if I could sum all that up in the interpretation, what he's saying is this. This is the point of today, so try and grab hold of this. What he's saying is this. We were careful to keep in mind that our behavior was attached to what you would believe. Okay. Take this home because this is really important for the believer. We were really careful when we were among you because we knew that when we were among you, that our behavior was attached to what you would believe. What we said would be attached to how you would see that we would live. And I don't think this requires too much interpretation, so let's just get right to the application, because he's talking about leaders, and he's a leader, so is Timothy, so is Silas, and the rest of the team that's gone with him into this city. How have some leaders negatively affected your faith because they weren't hypersensitive to these issues? Is it in the false way that they presented the gospel? Some of us grew up in churches that really, they did not present the gospel, and if they presented it, they presented it falsely, and it wasn't until you actually went to a church where they truly presented the gospel in clarity that you said, oh, and the light went on, you're like, that's the gospel. How about the fact that some churches talk about the gospel, but never clearly define the gospel, or call people to receive the gospel? I would sit and stand and kneel and sit and stand again for the reading of the gospel, and I didn't even know what the word gospel meant. Anyone ever listen and try to learn from a leader who's actually mean? And, and cover it up by saying I'm passionate? The Lord is my shepherd. He shoves me into green pastures. He drives me to still waters. Like, 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 that's not my good shepherd, right? And if I want to be a reflection of him, I want to make sure that if there are sheep that are entrusted to leaders, like Paul, Timothy, Silas, myself, I want them to be led to the still waters, right? I want them to, to lie down in the green pastures. That's what we're supposed to do as leaders. I remember a preacher giving a profound presentation on you reap what you sow. And when I was listening to this, I was convicted, I was inspired, I was motivated. And the whole second half of this message was on sowing the seed of my money into his TV ministry. And um, he was good. I was like impressed and disheartened at the same time. But what, what's the lesson here? Every leader, and when I say leader, I'm not talking about someone who stands in front of stools and microphones and podiums. Like anyone who's looking to be an influencer in the life of someone else, every leader always has to have this integration that a leader is leading in a way that is winning people to Christ. Like, like one leader can be so legalistic that they've actually forgotten what grace is. I said this, I think I may have said it yesterday, but Jesus said, go into the world to make disciples. But there's something that's so important in this, and that's this. What kind of disciples are you making? Because I can make legalistic disciples in the process. And they can get, I can make disciples that get so caught up in having the right shoes on and making sure that they have the right button-up shirt and that their hair is the proper haircut and everything else. And like Jesus isn't even a part of the entire part of what I'm trying to create in the life of the individual. Does this make sense? Say yes? Yes. Okay. Like another thing is, or I can be a leader that is so spiritually lax that love is not connected or governed by truth. So we're hugging each other and we're blessing each other. God bless you. Oh, no. God bless you. Oh, I am blessed. I'm blessed by the best, brother. And, and, and really, in the midst of it all, we're really not confronting the truth in each other's lives to really help us develop and grow. There are other leaders that are actually so controlling that the, that the church and the growth of the church and the effectiveness of the church never goes, never goes beyond the reach of the leader because he can't let things go beyond just how far his reach is. And so the church really never grows beyond 100, 130, 180 people because he has to control everything, right? 
On the other hand, you could have a leader that so easily is willing to empower people. One day he turns around and he looks around and he realizes, I just gave over my ministry. Or I just gave over my position. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So there's a, it's, it's not easy. There's an integration in all of this. You could have a, you could have a leader that is so formal and rigid um, that the gospel that he presents from his Bible is just seems so unattainable. Because he just seems so perfect because he has the perfect pastoral persona. And as you listen, you're like, that was a profound presentation. But I could never live up to that. And so when you leave, you might be impressed by him or her. But you're also slightly discouraged because you know that you could probably never attain to such perfection if that's full Windsor and whatever else he had that day, right? I'm just telling you, like, the things I grew up with that may have been discouraging in leadership spaces in which I was. And because I don't want to spend a lot of undue time here, but you've got to understand, what I just read to you in these verses is Paul coming into a ministry space in a city and how extra careful he was to be sensitive to them, how to minister to them, what to do and what to not do. So at the same time, God's brought us here to Thessalonians. This is where we are. I picked this last September. Now here we are in this book in the fire hall. So let me just say this. Don't worry. It's not that scary. I don't know how you do the research on this. If you know, you can tell me. But I'm just going to throw out a number here. I'm going to say 95 I'm going to say 95% of ministers start with the best intentions. Most people don't go into ministry for the money. But some do. Most people don't go into ministry for popularity or for prominence. But some do. Most people don't go into ministry for the praise of men. But some do. To, to because they like to uh, feel good by controlling other people, by controlling you. Not most, but some. What's the point in this little passage? Well, it's pathetic to hear a person butter up a believer because there's something that benefits them. And Paul's coming to them saying, I love you, I wanted to give the gospel to you, and I hope that you see how I was with my friends when we were around you. There was no buttering up going on here. There was no manipulation going on here. We weren't trying to be a burden financially to you here. We came to you because we loved you. And that's what we wanted you to know. There was no flattery here. There was nothing phony here. The Proverbs have a lot to say. And I don't know who struggles with this, but it has to be said because we go verse by verse through the scriptures and Paul talks about it here. There's something to be said about flattery, about covering up your real intentions by trying to make someone else feel better about themselves. We usually use another word today. It's called manipulation. Right? We don't use flattery, but we can manipulate someone by trying to change the narrative in such a way to make you feel better about yourself if you listen to me. Okay. And you have to wonder if there's a subtle sort of flattery that may be happening in the midst of all of that with those who play what would be called the social game. I don't have time to get into that. My point is this. Paul's making the point that people who... Here's the point. Listen. People who present God's word... Proclaim God's message, preach the gospel, they have to be responsible. They have to be integral. So I'll ask you the question I'm asking myself. No doubt I'm asking myself, and it's this. Please write it down. It's, it's short. Here's the question. Are you sincere? Question mark. I'm going to ask you one more question. Are you straightforward in your words and your actions? Are you sincere? Are you straightforward in your words and your actions? And you might say to yourself, you might say, nobody's actually always sincere. Okay, you're right. But here's the point. If I'm not straightforward, am I straightforward enough to say I wasn't straightforward? Because that's being straightforward, right? To, to have the humility to back up and say, 
I wasn't sincere when I said this. I really didn't mean that. I said that because you wanted me to say that, but that's not really how I feel. I feel like this. I'm just saying Paul has a, a, a very strong emphasis on sincerity and integrity, and I'm saying that we need to as well if we're going to reflect these Christ-like characteristics. It's easy to fall into the temptation and tell people what they want to hear in order to get what you want, in order to get ahead. Or watch this. Can you watch this real quick? Not only get ahead, but watch this. Put someone else behind. There's a big difference between you trying to get ahead and putting someone else behind. Like my brother writes in the carpentry business. He's been a union carpenter for years. And when we were, I worked with him when I was younger on the job. And when they told you to take sheets of drywall to the second floor, my brother would never they take a sheet. My brother would take two. My brother was good and he was fast. He was good at what he did and he was fast also. But you know what? That didn't help him because you know what happened to the rest of the guys? They didn't like them. They would say, hey, they'd say, hey, slow down there. Speedy Gonzales, where are you going? Um, they start making jokes. Hey, where's the fire? Right? It wasn't like my brother was going to get ahead. He's only four years into the union. They've got 15 years into the union. They're, he's not getting ahead of them. They just want to make sure he's behind them when it comes to the work. Does this make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay, and so I'm saying take that little metaphor there and just move it into your social circle. Move it into your Christian, Christian culture. And sometimes some pretty ugly stuff starts to show up. I'm not saying that I want to be the leader of that ministry. I'm just saying I don't want her to be. Ooh, now we're really getting close to some sensitive thing. I don't know a lot about women's ministry, but I'm just saying that kind of stuff happens. I would imagine. Okay. <laughs> I guess the question you have to ask yourself is we gotta finish up saying I'm saying, are you doing that? Is that a part of your DNA? Is that does that happen? Are you doing that? If you see someone else doing that, then will you go to prayer and ask God what he wants you to do with that? Because please, how you handle that in that moment, what you do. Seven, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not only the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear to us. Paul's driving on this point. He was with these new followers of faith. He's not flattering them. He's not praising them. He's not trying to get his own prominence or prosperity or his own uh, popularity. But he has this team. And they were completely focused on one fact, and that is the gospel. The people in these communities being connected to Christ. There was nothing more critical, vital, or essential than the gospel. That's what it was all about. And here's the point within the point. Paul uses some of this affectionate language that you see here. More affectionate than almost any of his letters that he writes in the New Testament. To say something about how gentle he was among them. And this is the point I'm going I'm to nail down and, we'll, and then we'll close out. People like to be known as powerful preachers. Wouldn't I want to be known if you messed up? Oh, no, I'm not even a powerful preacher. Man, that guy's a powerful preacher. Preacher, powerful preacher. Man, that preacher doesn't pull any punches. Man, he tells it like it is. He brings the fire and the brimstone. You know. From Philly, you'd be like, bro, you got the Holy Ghost, bro? <laughs> you know, like that's what we want to hear because it feels like it feels good. Um, I, I want to be on the cover of Power Preacher magazine. <laughs> right? I want to be on the cover of Bold Bro, you know, Incorporated. Um, I don't want to be on the cover of Meek magazine. I don't want to be, I don't want my picture of me and my swim trunks in the middle of Humility Illustrated. <laughs> Powerful. Powerful preaching. Hey, yeah, wow, I get it. Reading this passage, I'm also wondering this. Do I have your attention? Yeah. Is there something to be said about Jack? 
Is there something to be said about gentleness? Paul says, we warn you. Your city turned upside down for Jesus. People were like, the whole world's turning upside down because of your city. Everyone's talking about it. your love for Jesus. But you remember how we came to you? We came, we were gentle. And he takes his pen and his papyrus because we were as gentle with you as a mother who is nourishing her child. So this is the theme, you know, last week and this week has been these qualifying characteristics of our lives. It just keeps coming back to me, and maybe this would be a good study question for this upcoming week that you could ask one another when we leave here today. Like, look at Paul along with his team and list how many words, watch this, we just studied eight verses. Take your pen and go through the first eight verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And just take your pen and list how many words he said he wasn't, we weren't this, nor that, nor did we come in this way, and how many he was. But instead, we this, and we came to you in this, and we did that. You'd be amazed at what it was he said he would not do and what he said he would do. I'll give you two of these verses right here. First, he says he makes reference to himself being, hey, remember this? He said he was a trusted manager, like a steward. And then he gives you another one here, and he says, I was also like a tender mother. Beautiful. This is the great Apostle Paul. And this goes back to the point of the passage. A character of a manager is faithfulness. And the character of a, a, of a mother it is, is gentleness. Faithfulness and gentleness. As a minister, Paul was a man of authority, but he didn't use his authority to, to lash them. He used his authority to love them. Can you let that sink in just for a second? He didn't use his authority to lash them. He used his authority to love them. Hey, love them like children. Man, when you think about a mother nursing her child, that's pretty gentle. So much so that he loves them enough to write this letter to them. And then he feels so affectionately desirous towards them that he sends Timothy to them. And then he reminds them about how he nurtured them. Now, this is not the biblical application. This is just an interesting observation. But I want to bring it up to you because he uses this metaphor. Watch this. When a nursing mother eats food, the food that she eats is transformed, isn't it? It's transformed into milk for the baby. And so the baby believer, come with me in the metaphor now, feeds on the word of God and shares that nourishment so that it can grow. Peter talks about this in his letter, the Apostle Peter, when he talks about how newborn babes are longing for the milk of the Word. Hey, hey, a nursing mother can also have a child become ill because she did not take in the proper nutrients. She did not take in the proper food or substance. A nursing child can become ill through the reaction of something the mother had eaten or taken. What's my point? As gnarly as that is. In the same way, the Christian who's feeding others, whoa, the Christian who's feeding others must be careful what they feed on and then what they feed to others. This is the point I was making earlier. It's not enough to follow Jesus when he said, go and make disciples. You have to ask yourself, what kind of disciples are you making? Are you making disciples that are filled with love? Because Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples. By the money that you raise? By your right-wing activism? Your political stance? Your giving, your ability to hold protests out in the street, or by your gentleness and the fruit of the Spirit being born in your life, and by loving one another. K 
careful what you feed on and what you feed to others because that's the type of disciples that you're making. So Paul says, having come to know you, you took up so much space in our hearts. We didn't just preach the gospel to you. Our very, did you see this? Our very souls were attached to the message. So we didn't just share with you God's message. We shared with you our own hearts as well. And again, what's the lesson here? Somewhere in our society, to be aggressive and to be assertive has become a personality trait people want to possess. So you can go to Target and buy like a power tie, you know, and power socks. They actually have like power wristbands. I think there's a power ring you can buy that makes you like more powerful when you put on the ring. Um, Jesus talked about his disciples. And he talked about them also. And he talked about people who have power. And what did Jesus say? He said, in this world, you're going to see people that have power. And what you're going to notice when you see them is you're going to notice this. Those people are going to take their power. And they're going to lord that power over other people. So that their power is greater than the other people's power. And then the next thing Jesus says is this. But it shall not be so among you. For the one who seeks to be greatest in my kingdom shall be the servant of all. Jesus didn't say, if any among you are weak and, and heavy laden, heavy burden, come unto me and I'll give you the beat down. Come unto me and I'll really give you something to cry about. Come unto me and find rest for your soul. Find rest for your for your soul. That in the immaterial part of you that no one else can see. The, the material part that people look at, maybe they think you're okay. There's a part of you that's not okay. Hey, is there a part of you that's not okay? Jesus says, Come unto me, I want to give rest to, to that part of you that no one else sees. Jesus said, Come unto me because I am meek and I am humble at heart. So, yeah. It's a different message today. Why is that? Well, for a few reasons. One of them is, not only does Paul give us the gospel, this is important. This is important. Uh, and, I, and I'm closing with this, for real. <laughs> really? He doesn't only just give us the gospel and theology. Paul often also gives you something else. He gives you what's called his philosophy of ministry. He'll, he'll talk to you about doctrine and theology and he'll explain things about Christ. It's and then he'll also tell you why he ministers and how he ministers. And still being privileged to, to stand in this place that I'm standing right now, I try to preach that pattern of Paul. I also see it in the lessons of the Lord. Jesus not only taught on the kingdom of God, but he also taught his disciples specific examples. How to lead by example. How to be mindful. How to be humble. How to be watchful. How to be prayerful. And here, today, it's about how to be gentle. How to lead with gentleness. Remember last week, as we were leaving the building, I was saying, let your gentleness, Philippians chapter 2, let your gentleness be known unto all men. And here's the reason Paul says, because the Lord is at hand. I mean, that might mean he's returning soon, but it also may, might mean that he's like, he's really close to you. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and what? And, and, gen and gentleness. And gentleness. Gentleness is being considerate of the feelings of other people. Gentleness is being sensitive to the needs of other people. Gentleness is doing unto others what you would want to have them do unto you. Gentleness is being quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath. Gentleness is being teachable and being willing to learn. Gentleness is brokenness. Gentleness is repentance. Gentleness is being able to look someone square in the eyes and say, this is where I was wrong. Will you forgive me? 
And then gentleness is receiving that person's repentance and that brokenness and returning it with forgiveness as well. Maybe someone needs to hear that today. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's someone in this room. Maybe it's someone who's going to watch this this afternoon. Last week, we left off talking about discovering, identifying, contemplating, or qualifying characteristics of our Christianity. So as we wrap up today, is there one thing that you can do to take an intentional step on this journey towards gentleness? One thing. One thing that you're not doing right now. What are you not doing right now? That if you decided to, to stand and sing in just a moment and walk out of here and you began to do this one thing, you would take a step towards gentleness in a way that you haven't taken it for. Maybe, it's, maybe you need to call someone that you just haven't called in a long time. Send a text, play it safe, but begin the journey. Maybe someone that's blowing you off, you just gotta get into their space and be like, hey, are you good? Because I wanna make sure we're okay. There's a lot of that going on right now. And I think we need to do that. I'm not going to spend the rest of our time with examples. I'll let the Holy Spirit press into your own heart what that looks like for you. I just know that we need to do it. Philippians says when Jesus is in uh, uh, you know, so many contexts in the Gospels, you see him doing it. Philippians says that we should all have it. Uh, everyone should see it. Ephesians says that it's the fruit of the Spirit. Paul says right here in Philippians that if you were with me, my friends, you would feel it. Jesus says, come unto me and you'll find it. And after Jesus washed a dozen dirty feet, he said, what I just did, go do it. And if you do, that's how you go. To a what?
to this end that um, I think are really wonderful verses, and then we'll sing the chorus one more time. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. And the second verse says, His word shall not fail you. Believe him, and all will be well. Go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to tell you. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Thank you. 